Okay, uh, the next section as we're working our way from the outside of the brain down to the inside is the limbic system. And we've talked about the cerebrum. And the next section that we're gonna talk about is the diencephalon. <clears throat> we may put that into this video depending on how much time um, or how long this video is. And the limbic system is kind of an arbitrary division um, because it has parts and it says here components in the cerebrum. And over here, it has components in the diencephalon. So there are six pieces of this limbic system total. We have in green, the cingulate gyrus. We have in purple, the um, parahippocampal gyrus. We have the hippocampus. We have this mammillary body here, the amygdal amygdaloid body here, and then the hypothalamus and thalamus. We're, we're really only going to focus on, I'm gonna grab my highlighter again. These are the parts that I want you to know. I want you to know the cingulate gyrus. I want you to know the hippocampus. I want you to know the amygdaloid body. And we're really not gonna talk about the rest of these. We're gonna save the thalamus and the hypothalamus for uh, when we talk about the diencephalon. We're gonna skip the mammillary body. We're not gonna worry about this parahippocampal gyrus, but you'll see the parts that I highlighted are the larger parts of this limbic system. So again, cingulate gyrus in green, hippocampus in purple, and the amygdaloid body in um, uh, kind of the darker purple. So we've got lighter purple and darker purple. Well, what, what's the purpose of this limbic system? Um, this is the seat of your emotions and memory. So this takes care of forming memories and a processing emotion. If you're feeling it, um, it it's here. <clears throat> also, um, it has a component in motivation. It allows us to have the desire to want to do something. Um, so what we see is these guys work together processing what's going on up here in the cerebrum and then processing uh, what's going to happen in the diencephalon. A couple other markers to note before we start to talk about the specifics of this. This is the corpus callosum. So this is that band of fibers that connects the left and the right hemisphere. And I'm just going to put a V here and a V here. These are ventricles. And we're going to talk about those last. Back when we talked about cerebral spinal fluid, in the um, nervous tissue physiology, I said there were cavities in the brain that that cerebral spinal fluid circulated through that um, uh, brought uh, support and brought in nutrients and carried away waste. And those are the ventricles here. Again, we'll talk about those later. So I want you to understand the position of the cingulate gyrus, but the two parts that we're gonna talk about are here, the hippocampus and the amygdaloid body. The hippocampus is responsible for learning and long-term memory. There was a fellow called uh, Henry Malison, I believe, and um, he was having extreme seizures. And so they went in and they removed his hippocampus and it improved his seizures, but it had an effect that they didn't anticipate he became unable to form long-term memories. If you've ever seen the movie 50 First Date with, um, oh, who's the actress? Shoot, um, she was, um, oh, anyways, it had Adam Sandler and uh, a famous actress, I can't remember her name, but at the beginning of every day, she starts that day over. She can't form long-term memories. Well, that's not just fiction, it's actually what happens if you have damage to the hippocampus. The memories that you formed before damage to your hip hippocampus remain. And so he could remember everything before the day of his surgery. But after that, it didn't matter what happened to him, who he met. When he met someone, even if he'd seen them every day for 30 years, it was like he met them for the first time. Because you have to have that hippocampus for um, <clears throat> long-term memories. The other one I wanna talk about is this amygdaloid body. And this um, plays a part also in memory. Uh, it has a, a part in fight or flight. So we're talking about fear, your fear response. But what's interesting is, and you don't see it in this diagram, the um, sensory bundle of nerves for smell are called the olfactory bulbs. And they come out and they kind of, they kind of have this end here. 
So these are called the olfactory bulbs. And if you remember, we talked about the fact those lie right over top of that cribriform plate. And so we get smells from the outside environment that come filter up and they hit that olfactory bulb and they go straight into your limbic system. That's why smell, so it's because of this, that smell often produces the strongest emotion. So maybe you went out with someone and they wore a specific cologne or a perfume and it didn't end well. And as soon as you smell that cologne or perfume again, you are boom, right back into the emotion of that situation. Or maybe you got burned up when you were camping when you were a little kid. Now, every time you smell campfire, you have that concern or that sensation of um, back when you were young and, and you feel it right away. Um, and the reason for that is this amygdala body that gets brought directly into your limbic system. All right, we're, we're pretty short for video length here. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do diencephalon in this video as well. So let's bring in the diencephalon sheet. So we're gonna talk about um, three parts to the diencephalon and we're gonna talk about its overall function. So the diencephalon is a relay station. Oops. Diencephalon is a relay station. So what happens in the diencephalon, and we're gonna talk about number one, number two, and number three, is that signals are relayed between the cerebrum and the brainstem. And this is the, the brainstem is in green. So if you have a signal and uh, let's say uh, you sense a, a, a tiger nearby and, and you become afraid, that has to get sent down into the brainstem because you're going to involuntarily speed up your um, pulse rate and your blood flow. Well, that goes from here to here via this diencephalon. Structure number one is the thalamus. This is divided into areas called nuclei. So it has divisions called nuclei. And this routes signals uh, through the brain. So this is primarily uh, routing and relaying, routing and signals within the brain. Let's talk about structure number three and then we'll talk about structure number two. So structure number three is the pituitary gland. And back when we talked about the endocrine system, we talked about the fact that this is the master gland. It controls all of the other glands and it's not technically considered to be part of the brain. So um, it doesn't really, um, it, it's kind of considered to be its own separate structure. But this is releasing the uh, hormones that'll turn on the um, adrenal glands or turn off the adrenal glands. It'll activate the um, thyroid or the parathyroid or deactivate them based on what it releases. So area number two is called the hypothalamus. H-Y-P-O-T-H-A-L-A-M-U-S, hypothalamus. This is the connecting region between the brain. So everything back here is the brain. And then this is considered to be really part of the endocrine system. So what the hypothalamus does is it links the brain and the endocrine system. So this is the link between the brain and the pituitary.
And so if you have a signal that's coming from your, again, that somatosensory, the tigers in your environment, you need to speed it up. It gets routed down here. Um, it's going, and in this case, part of it's going to go into the brainstem. Part of it's going to come down through the hypothalamus and it's going to cause the um, pituitary to release the hormone that's needed to turn on your adrenal glands to produce epinephrine, which gets turned into adrenaline. So again, and, and we think of this as kind of um, the middle, an area in the middle of the brain. Area in the middle of the brain. And I don't want to call it the midbrain because there's actually a region called the midbrain. So what are our takeaways? Uh, we talked about the limbic system that is going to control your emotions. And we have things called the um, hippocampus and the amygdaloid body, just called the amygdala for short. And the fact that um, uh, those areas are responsible for memory and emotions. Um, and then we get into this diencephalon, which is these three pieces, and they're going to route things uh, these two are, and then the pituitary is actually part of the endocrine. Okay, that finishes up this one. Uh, on the next one, we'll begin to talk about the brainstem.